this, this kind of reminds me of, um, I did a TEDx talk um, in 2020, in April. So it was obviously uh, canceled because yeah. of uh, COVID, but we actually went ahead and did it. And it was probably one of the toughest presentations I ever did because I had to do it in front of a camera. Uh -huh. No audience, 12 minutes, uh, and it took 25 takes wow. for me to get it. So it, this is bringing back some uh, <laughs> little, it's not PTSD yeah. per se, it's more along the lines of like a kid's stretch. Uh, so as some of you uh, might have heard, uh, <clears throat> there should have been two of us tonight. Uh, my wife is not feeling well. Uh, crossing our fingers that it's not COVID. Uh, but uh, after working in schools for, between the two of us, almost uh, over 50 years, uh, we've learned that uh, it's kind of like a Petri dish. And right now that Petri dish is, is getting a little bit larger. So nonetheless, so I'm here. And uh, I, I come to this with a, a background in education, also a, a fascination in the adolescent brain. Uh, and also as a parent. And my son is 31 years old, and throughout the evening I'll be making references to him here and there. So even though I'm up here presenting, uh, well, he's not. <laughs> he's up there. Uh, he, he, he may come into the picture. Uh, we have a small group, so I, I would really like to try and keep this as informal as possible. And if you want at the end to have questions and at any particular point, that's fine uh, because the, the the energy of the presentation is, is not just from me, it's, it's, it's from all of us. So kind of like the title says, uh, a lot of what's going on with them and between you is stuff that's going on up here. Uh, I'm here to deliver some really good news. They do have brains. <laughs> they do use them. And to some degree or another, they actually use them a little bit better than we do just very differently. And what I'd like to do is by the time that you leave or by the time that you finish watching this, you have a, a better understanding of what that brain looks like and how to not take their behavior so personally uh, because it, it really can get to you at times. Uh, so I'm going to take you back a little bit to what some of those conversations might have looked like when they were younger. And uh, just out of curiosity, if you don't mind, just jump around the room. Uh, what ages of kids do you have? Ooh, uh, almost 14, 12, and almost 10. Okay. So you're in it. Okay. My youngest is a senior here. Okay. She's 16. Yep. And I have a 20 year old. Yep. And a 28 year old. Okay. So you're still in it? <laughs> yep. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. The, the 28 year old. Still in it. 16 and 19. Okay. 13, 10, and 8. 13, 10, and 8. 13, 11, and 18. Okay. Great. So we're all there. Great. So this is um, what the conversation might have looked like when they were younger, and then it actually <laughs> sort of develops into this type of conversation. A few reasons why I really love this picture is because we, as human beings, have a tendency to raise our voice when we feel like someone is not listening to us. And one of those powerful uh, interventions I ever heard, it was back in my very first teaching job, 1995 at Cardin Spelman High School in the Bronx. Dean, uh, one of the deans of students, because there were almost 3,000 students there at the time, said to me uh, in his Bronx accent, he called me Terry. He said, Terry, if you want the kids to listen to you, what you need to do is you need to lower your voice. And I looked at him and I thought he was out of his mind. I was like, how, how is that even possible? He said, it's going to take some time. But if you really want people to listen to you, lower you. And think about it. When we drop our voices, we actually lean in a little bit. Every so often throughout the evening, what I'll be doing is throwing in tidbits of latest findings in neuroscience. So there's a term that's used, and we'll just call it for lack of a better expression right now. It's the sort of evening FM DJ voice, that low voice, that <laughs> Barry White voice. 
Research studies show that with this voice, your brainwave activity begins to slow down. Because what will happen is our brains tend to match the sound waves that are going on around us. Raise your hand if you like to be at the beach. The sound of the ocean. The cat's purr. Those types of <clears throat> waves that are made, sound waves and EEG, EEG waves, are actually very, very low. But the sound of someone yelling is actually very high. I don't know about you, but if somebody yells at me, I tend to get a little defensive. So also, if you take a good look at the picture, she is, um, in her own way, sending a very clear message to her, her mother or the teacher. And there's no eye contact. There's earbuds in. And she's looking down at her phone, what I like to call the world's largest umbilical cord. So um, one of the nice things that I got to experience as a parent was uh, I had some quiet time with my son and he was one of those kids that would uh, wake up in the morning and just like go. So from the moment he woke up until he passed out, and he was also quite a bit of a talker. So Saturday mornings to go into his room, watch him to be very peaceful, because I also knew that when he woke up, there was kind of an excitement because this was going to be our time. And our time was Fruit Loops and Bugs Bunny Road Run Around. So that was like that, that um, sort of father-son bonding time. Things started to change a little bit when he got older because uh, I would go into his room and that's what I would see. And this was, say, three o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday, mm -hmm. five minutes before the bus. <laughs> and I heard a couple of people talking before we got started in the presentation that there's also an odor that comes with it as well. So years ago, I had worked at an all boys high school. And at five o'clock in the afternoon after freshman football, the freshman corridor had an odor to it that was, um, there was also an additional thing called Axe body spray. Oh, yeah. uh, brutal. <laughs> anyway, um, sort of go into the room and see this mess in there and think, you know, what is going on with my child? Now, this isn't just boys. This also happens with girls. So fascinatingly, uh, scientists have been able to identify that the adolescent sleep clock gets pushed back by approximately two to three hours. This is not a choice that adolescents make. And it's not every single adolescent. I'll get to a slide where I talk about speaking in general. Um, but at the center of our brains is probably one of the most powerful organs within the human body called the hypothalamus. And right smack in the middle of the hypothalamus is our biological sleep clock. And this is called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Your assignment tonight is to go home, have three glasses of wine, and repeat that 10 times later. <laughs> so the suprachiasmatic nucleus is where melatonin is released. For whatever reason, I didn't set it up this way, but the universe decided that when kispeptin is released, which is sort of like the, the precursor to estrogen levels rising and testosterone levels rising, these hormones find their way into the center of the brain, and they, they marinate and they delay the release of melatonin. <laughs> and there's, there has to be a, an evolutionary purpose behind that. Maybe as we were getting ready to find a mate and procreate, this gave us an opportunity to um, hunt longer and maybe protect the family. So, so there's gotta be some sort of biological component. Uh, on top of it, we throw this in there. Uh, and what we have is we have a chronically sleep deprived a group of adolescents. And to be quite honest with you, forget about the sleep clock. We have a chronically sleep deprived population. So Mary Karskadam was probably uh, from Brown University was probably one of the first ones to really uh, push this um, uh, put, uh, delay in start times for high schools because what her research identified is that in order to function optimally, the average adolescent requires nine hours and 15 minutes of sleep per night. And it's usually laughter that comes from it, especially when I'm talking to students about this, because they're like, you know, a little bit more animated. They're like, no way. It's not happening. Can't do it. And 
they're being honest, you know, with the demands of AP classes, with the demands of extracurricular activities, some of them working part-time jobs, keeping up with social media, their friends, taking showers and so on and so forth. Some of them are lucky if they get six and a half hours of sleep. But I've got some good news for you. When we look at the research of schools who've decided to delay start times, what we have found is that even just 36 minutes more of sleep on average for some students can be the difference between a C and an A. Yeah. So by delay, mm -hmm. do you mean delay to nine or do you think eight twenty five is like the speed? This is delayed from school starter. No, I know. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. exactly what so I'm it, asking. So it's completely up to the individual district because okay. in Connecticut, uh, first period might be 725. So if you go to, I believe, North Salem School District, uh, it's probably around the same. Uh, and the thing that many districts struggle with is, is busing and extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. And it's a financial piece. However, uh, when advocating for this, what, what I typically invite districts to do is to take a look at Fayetteville County in Kentucky, where car accident rates for 16 to 18 year olds decreased. Mm -hmm. So we're not just talking about higher SAT scores. We're not just talking about better GPAs. What we're talking about is the potentiality for saving lives. I'm not making this up. You all know this, that when we look at what happens when the clocks get pushed back, car accident rates are through the roof for adults. That week, people report feeling more stressed, feeling more irritable. So, th so there's um, some validity to this. So some initial so uh, thoughts here. Uh, no matter what, whenever I speak about teenagers, each of you is going to have probably an, an experience or a child that doesn't necessarily fit. Um, that, that's just the nature of psychological research. That's just the nature of human behavior. The word adolescence itself is we can actually find references in Shakespeare's writings, but our understanding of adolescence came from a psychologist who lived at the same time as Sigmund Freud, G. Stanley Hall. And he wrote a two volume work in the late 1800s called Adolescence, part one, part two. And he said it started at 12 and it ends at 18. And his basic description is that it's a great, it's a period of great storm and stress. And what we're finding is some of you might be experiencing that, but we're also finding that it doesn't start at 12. And I did a presentation many years ago up in Canada, and I said to the group, you know, when does it end? And somebody shouted out, never, um, for men. <laughs> but um, it's probably not 18 anymore. So let me just throw it out to you. Um, when do you think adolescence starts? currently from our mindset. Like if, if we were to ask a group of sociologists or psychologists, what, what would they agree? Say, this is the start. Nine. 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 It's about 10. Yes. 10. Yeah. I think in about five years, if the American diet continues the way it's going to continue, it will be nine. So when we look at uh, the average age of a girl's first period, in Northern Europe and the United States in 1850, it was 15. 15. Our understanding of Romeo and Juliet being 13 is probably not true. So what happened? What's going on with our diet? And it's not the hormones, it's the sugar. So after 1850, our diet started to consist more of wheat, more of corn. And then in the 1970s, a wonderful product came along that was mm -hmm. high fructose corn syrup. Uh, if you have a McDonald's cheeseburger, you'll probably find about 24 grams of sugar in a, the cheeseburger. Why a cheeseburger has sugar in it is absolutely beyond me. But the average ketchup <laughs> serving itself in like one teaspoon probably has about eight grams of sugar. Uh, it is seven to eight times more addictive than heroin and cocaine when it's experienced subjectively. You find somebody who can have one Oreo cookie. It ain't happening. <laughs> and research shows if people have three Oreo cookies and do a little bit of cocaine, their dopamine receptor sites look the same. 
They look the same. So we have kids who are in lower socioeconomic communities who don't have access to healthy food. And girls there, because of the obesity rates, are actually starting their first period at seven and a half. We have boys who are, are entering puberty at the age of nine. And the reason why is because puberty responds to fat levels in the body. You probably know as well as I do, if you don't burn sugar, it turns to fat. So I think in New York City, um, and if you look in a kindergarten class, about 35 to 40 percent of those children are not overweight. They are obese. So this is one of the things that's contributing to it. Uh, and still, you know, if you go into school cafeterias, if you walk down the hallways, you will find Gatorade, which is nothing more than sugar water. So starts at 10. When does it end? Can't say never. Somebody already took that. Twenty-five. Why'd you say twenty-five? Just out of curiosity. Um, he's a twenty-four-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. No, he's actually okay. Well, <laughs> well, think of think about um, two industries that use twenty-five as sort of a cutoff point. Car rental. Car rental is one, and it has to do with cars. Insurance. Insurance. Yeah, if you look at the National Traffic and Safety Board statistics, what you'll see is accidents, I'm watching here, uh, 16, as soon as you start driving, boom, continue, 25, they drop, 80, they go back up. So I'm not making that up. You can, you can look at it. Um, so what we think is that, you know, the brain is, say, developed at 25. Probably not true. Research that came from Sarah Jane Blakemore, who wrote a wonderful book called Reinventing Ourselves, indicates that she's seeing the prefrontal cortex still developing for 40 year olds. And there's hope. There is hope. <laughs> yes, there's hope because what I'm talking about today really is nothing more than a helicopter ride around Manhattan. We still don't know if those buildings are commercial or residential. We're really just skimming the surface of the brain. 80-year-old men, study from University of Pittsburgh, shows new cellular growth within their amygdala, the emotional part of the brain. The old expression, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, nothing further than the truth. So this is, I find this information to be really exciting because this expanding adolescence in 25, probably because of the uh, economic crash in 07, 08, and, you know, kids just came to my basement and lived there. And we know that the brain responds to its environment. So if that 20-year-old brain doesn't have the responsibilities that a 20-year-old in the 1960s does, it's not going to act like an adult. So we call this like that delayed launching period. And it pushed everything back. People are getting married later. People are having kids later. But at the same time, we are living longer. So this isn't a bad thing. It just, it's just a struggle for you because now they get to spend more time with you <laughs> trying things out and making mistakes. That's what, and that's what they're supposed to do. That's what adolescence is. It's sort of like, can I do this? Can I do this? Can I do this? And then what about here? Our job is to say, nope, can't do that. Um, so that's what makes it so much fun. No matter where we are in human behavior, I think a lot of us like to lean towards this idea that, you know, oh, it's this one thing. So if we talk about um, school shootings, there are people who are firmly planted in the idea that this is a mental health issue. And there's another group that says it's access to guns. And then there's another group that says it's social media and video game uh, violence. It's, it's actually E, all of the above. There's rarely one singular thing that goes into it. So that's good news for us as parents because it lets us know that we are not necessarily responsible for all of their behavior. <laughs> and I really do believe that we are merciless with ourselves. <clears throat> so I invite you to put the bat down and start accepting the fact that there is such a thing as a good enough parent. But unfortunately, a lot of us show up with Samsonite bags and Louis Vuitton bags from our own childhoods. 
And in those bags are how our parents parented us. So um, can't really get into that. We only got uh, another hour or so. <laughs> I'll be back. Uh, what we also know from the research is that kids do have the capacity to be resilient. And the one thing that resiliency has in common across the board, whether you look at war-torn countries, whether you look at children who've grown up in traumatic homes, it's that all of them had access to one adult who that child felt cared about them. Their chances for resiliency automatically double. It's that one adult. Sometimes it's you. A lot of times it's not you. It might be that person at school. It might be that person at, uh, in an athletic activity. It might be someone uh, in a religious group. Just one adult, an aunt or an uncle. And if that's the one that they're going to talk to, then give them that space. I think the, 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 the last bullet point, um, anxiety has gotten a really bad rap. Um, if you're a human being, guess what? You're going to experience anxiety. And a lot of us um, use this expression, anxiety, like we, we have it. We, we carry it around with us. So um, when I work with students and they you know, share with me that they have anxiety, uh, one of the things I do from a clinical perspective is I, is I uh, say, well, look, there's, you know, there are people, you ever hear somebody who says that, you know, oh, I'm so OCD. Um, you know, OCD predominantly has to do with intrusive thoughts. And significant cases of OCD, somebody can't leave the house without checking that the oven is off 90 times. And they say, no, well, you know, I guess like, you know, I'm a neat pick. I say, okay, so with anxiety, have you been diagnosed from a, a mental health clinician with an anxiety disorder? Well, no, but I have anxiety. I said, okay, so do you have anger? Do you have sadness? No, I feel those things. So then I invite you to think about anxiety the same way. Because anxiety in and of itself is not a bad thing. Anxiety can be one of the greatest teachers, uh, just like a bad relationship. It, it's definitely uncomfortable, but stepping out from that bad relationship, that's a really powerful learning experience because that relationship teaches us everything that we don't want in future relationships. Anxiety is healthy at times because it teaches us to look both ways. If you open up the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, you're not going to find a diagnosis for test anxiety. It does not exist. If someone is anxious before a test, there's a very good chance that they're concerned about performing well. Good. <laughs> That's a good thing. If somebody didn't prepare for the test, maybe they're a little anxious for it. If they're taking a test that might have an impact on whether or not they get into a certain college, it's appropriate to experience that type of anxiety. But if it's crippling, that's where I invite people to seek out the assistance of somebody who's skilled in that area. Um, so I don't poo-poo anxiety. I just caution us in as much as this is something that's to be avoided at all costs where it's something that's actually quite normative. It is something that's gonna happen. When you look at the research of stress, uh, what we find is that it's not just stress that impacts us on such a somatic level and such a physical level, it's how we think about stress. It's the same idea with anxiety. Um, so this generation, and when I talk about this generation, the young ones, the ones who are 13 and under, what I'm talking about is alpha gen, and then the generation above that are what we call Gen Z, and then the millennials. So let's say Gen Z and Alpha Gen, they are not the most anxious generation to ever come along. I'm going to flip it. We're the most anxious parents. <laughs> Gen X. Because we're the ones who grew up looking back on our childhoods and began to actually do the research and say, well, I don't know if hitting is actually that effective. I don't know if throwing a kid into a pool is actually a good idea. I don't know if pushing them down the mountain is really that good of an idea. So to some degree or another, we swung the pendulum. And raise your hand if you've heard of a helicopter parent. 
first time that appeared in American literature was 1977. 77. We don't have helicopter parents anymore. We have stealth farmer parents. We have snowplow parents. We have lawn mower parents, people who want to clear the way for kids so that they don't experience anything negative. That can be really damaging. It's the same idea. If you're working out with weights, the only way in which you're going to build toned muscle or build muscle at all is if you tear it. Because once that muscle is torn, when it comes back, it is stronger. So there's value in an F. There's value in a negative experience. There's value in disappointment because it builds, I'm not going to say character, it actually builds resiliency, which is crucial for adults. Does that make sense? How many of you remember Radio Shack? Oh, yeah. Okay. My favorite one was Crazy Eddie, yeah. where his prices are, there you go. Hey, nobody beats the whiz. Okay, all of that, just to make us feel old, all of that is in this. And the reason why I bring this up is because all of us probably back then were hovering somewhere around our teenage years. So everyone in this room has an idea of what it's like to be a teenager. Everyone, because we were all teenagers. But no one in this room has any idea of what it's like to be a teenager now. No idea. I don't know how I could do it. Average age at which a child in the United States gets their first smartphone is 11. 11. Does an 11 year old have the capacity to say it's time for me to put this down? I'm 53. <laughs> I have a tough time when I'm watching Jaws for the 73rd time. I have a tough time with all right, so this period of time that we're talking about, this 10 to 25, we can't do that. We're going to shrink it tonight and really focus a lot on 10 to 15 and a little bit on 15 to 20. So there's all these changes with puberty, and along comes the smartphone, which has really changed the equation because you can track them now. They have instant access to you. You have instant access to them. So the concept of delayed gratification really isn't part of this generation. So it's really thrown things off. In and of itself, it is not a bad thing. We are living at one of the most exciting times where we can really find anything out that we want to. Heck, as somebody who writes college recommendation letters, there are artificial intelligence programs that will write them for me. And as somebody who teaches college level classes, I've had to change the way in which I teach because of artificial intelligence. But I will tell you what, it has gotten me back to having students give presentations in front of the classes. And you know as well as I do that one of the most important skills for us is not necessarily which college we graduated from, but whether or not we can look someone in the eye, shake hands in the first three seconds of an interview. That's what gets them hired. So they're also transitioning from middle school to high school, uh, where some of them might get the information that you can't do this in high school where some of them look at high school students and they hear about AP classes and they start to become a little sort of intimidated about it. It's okay, it's normal, but it can also create a little bit of stress for them. There's all sorts of existential threats that they experience, and I find this fascinating. As a member of Gen X, there were some things that I was afraid of existentially. First and foremost, raise your hand if you ever drilled for an atomic bomb. Oh, I did. None of you ever drilled for that? Oh, yeah. Hit, we were told to hide under the desk. Like that would have worked. We were, we were about 12 miles outside of New York City when we would have been vaporized. Raise your hand if you ever drilled for a fire. Yep. Did it ever happen? How many times a school year do they drill for lockdowns? Stay in place. Lock out. So they have multiple drills, and there are multiple school shootings around them. Another existential threat for me was killer bees. They were going to come up from South America into Mexico, also as a member of Gen X, AIDS. All, and AIDS only targeted a very small population in the 80s. So all of these existential threats that I grew up with didn't happen. This existential threat for them is happening. It's very real. They may not talk about it, 
but it's present. And then with colleges becoming test optional, with the Common App going completely online, and hundreds upon hundreds of colleges now having acceptance rates that are under 20%. Many of them are wondering, is there a college for me? And newsflash, there is. We just may need to rethink it to some degree or another. And, and uh, there's a gentleman from Marist College, Kent Reinhardt, he's the director of undergraduate admissions. His message basically is, yeah, you got in, now what? So getting in is important, but more important is what are you gonna do now that you're there? And when we look at the colleges of students who go to Harvard Law School, they're from all over the country. And they are from tier one colleges, tier two colleges, tier three colleges, and tier four colleges. So very few colleges actually have the name that's so powerful that it will sort of help that student get a job immediately. The, the majority of them really depends on what that student does when they get on campus. So during this time, they're also disconnecting from you and they stop relying on you for feedback and they start relying on other people for feedback. The same 14 year old brain who thinks it's a good idea to throw a rotten watermelon on a passing train. They're gonna run it by that, what do you think? And of course that 14 year old is going to say this is a good idea because the way in which we process risk is totally different than that. When we think about risk, we think about two things. We think about physical harm, immediate physical harm and long-term consequences. When they process risk, two things, fun and friends. In other words, how much fun am I gonna have and who's gonna see it? This changed it because I don't know if you had this experience, like if there was a fight growing up in school, when did that fight happen? After school. And it spread around. And then everybody showed up for the fight. And if people didn't fight, you'd make them fight. Because damn it, you've been waiting all day for this thing. It's like we're waiting for the dopamine fix, that excitable chemical. Doesn't have this is instantaneous dopamine. So the research shows that all of us, to some degree or another, anytime that phone goes off, we're looking for the hit. So I know that I'm talking about te I'm talking about adolescents and potentially being addicted to smartphones, but we all probably are. Uh, Dan Huberman from the Huberman Lab was a, uh, a neurobiologist and ophthalmologist from Stanford University. Has done some really interesting research, and he finds that baseline dopamine levels will typically rise for people who don't check their smartphone for at least one hour in the morning. That's hard to do. And think about only maybe 15, 10, 15 years ago, that was not part of our lives. And now it's such a crucial part. Heck, I can do five sessions on dating and romantic relationships, but I'll only say this. The first two months of any new relationship, it doesn't matter if you're 16, 26, or 66, that brain looks like it's addicted to heroin. This is why teen relationships are so maddening. And if we say, don't worry, there's plenty of more people out there, there's only one for them. And this is why they're texting each other 80 times in one hour when they don't get a response back. It is actually a normative experience for teenagers to go through this. That's why I am not a huge fan of teens very early on being completely exclusive because it can lead to some interesting behavior. What age do you think that is? <clears throat> Probably, it really depends on the kid, but anytime between 14 and 16. Yeah, because once you start, um, the other thing too is if you match it with driving the car, there's a certain, there's a certain level of sort of forced independence and forced maturity in that. So, and they've and to some degree or another, they've also gotten to that first year of high school. So you're giving them an opportunity to create an individual self. 
um, I only want to say something about uh, marijuana. It is now the most commonly reported used drug in rehab centers in the United States. For decades, it was alcohol. For a period of time, it was cocaine or crack. For a small period of time, it was crystal meth. It is now marijuana. Uh, so if I picked up a nickel bag in the 1980s, the average joint contained 7% THC. You can buy wax, liquid THC. You can drink it now. You can buy gummies that are 95 to 97% pure THC. And it's becoming more and more legal across the country. So there are a lot of researchers who say there's no coincidence between the correlation of anxiety rates rising for teenagers and the legalization of marijuana and the potency of marijuana. It's very easy for them to access now. It is classified as a mild hallucinogen. So there are people who coming off of marijuana will actually experience hallucinations. So the marijuana of the 80s did not do that to people. It got them high, it got them, they got the munchies and things like that. Um, but you probably knew a, a person or two who was burnt because they smoked so much of it. Um, so if the purity of it is that much higher, you don't need to do that much of it in order for it to have a really negative impact. So we know that there's an increase in sensation seeking. And, and the last thing I want to say with regards to driving, a lot of states think 16 is good enough for them to get behind uh, 1,000 pound vehicle that can go up to 120 miles per hour. Here's some sober statistics. The minute that you let a second teenager in the car with a new teenage driver, the chances for a fatal accident double. Three, they triple. Four, they quadruple. If your kids are newly licensed, my invitation to you is unless they are going to school or to work, do your best to refrain the refrain them from joining other teenagers in the car. It can be really dangerous, yeah. Do you think it makes a difference if they, when they get in their licenses, do you think they're fine? Or do you think it's part of it is just being a new driver? Part of it is definitely being a new driver. I, I mean, you know, obviously you're 40. Mm -hmm. It's a little different, but although that's, I don't think you're really 40 to get your license. But, right. if you're, but, it, but I've seen more and more that they're, they're not that excited about getting their licenses anymore around here because they'd rather, you know, that they're happy with Uber, they're happy with Uber mom or mm -hmm. Uber dad. And the one good thing I will say is, I mean, I know what y'all think, but I think that kids today have a much clearer sense of don't drink and drive, yeah. which back in my day, we didn't. We did not have that. Yeah. I mean, they were, you know. Yeah, kids are, um, for lack of a better expression, this generation is um, pretty good. Uh, if we look at use of illicit drugs, it's actually gone down. If we look at teen pregnancy rates, it's gone down. If we look at the number of teenagers who are using uh, protection for sex, it's increased. So, you know, they're, they're pretty good. They're very socially active in many ways. And the... 18, maybe 20 getting their license is all part of that delayed adolescence. So I don't necessarily think it's good or bad. It really depends on, on where the individual at. What I think is very risky is when you add the teenagers to the car. Um, so if you put all that together, essentially this is what you get. Ah! <laughs> I was just making sure that you were still awake. <laughs> now folks, that's you. <laughs> with your 13 year old, or maybe when they go for a drive, uh, that's their teachers. And sometimes that's them after listening to you lecture them. Um, but even though I started off saying, you know, they do have brains, uh, there's some really interesting things that go on with their brains. Uh, they actually have what we call cognitive distortions. So uh, there was a psychologist uh, who popularized this theory of cognitive development. His name was Jean Piaget. And he said, kids go through these four stages. They start with sensory motor, concrete, pre-operational, and get to this formal operational stage. And after about the age of seven, they are no longer egocentric. 
apparently Piaget didn't work that much for teenagers. Uh, there is really no more narcissistic animal on the planet other than a teenager, uh, unless you turn on Bravo. And, and there's some narcissism there. Uh, but uh, David Elkind in 67 started to, uh, you know, in working with teenagers and doing some research studies, started to become a little bit more curious and said, you know, th there, there's this thing going on with them where they start to sort of believe that everybody is watching them. Uh, and people knew this for a while and, you know, just said, oh, you know, there it's a moral issue. Um, you know, if, if you if you read some some scripture, it's spare the rod, spoil the child. Um, what Elkind started to hypothesize is sort of like if their body is changing and they're watching their bodies change, if they're watching their hips expand, if they're looking at their friends and mustache hair, Adam's apple. Who's got more facial hair? Who's growing faster? Who's got more friends? They obviously then start to think people are watching them. It makes perfect sense. It's this imaginary audience. So that was in 67. And later on in the mid 2010s, Lawrence Steinberg from Temple University decided to test teens and adults in terms of risk-taking behavior and the imaginary audience. So he put teenagers in sort of a driving setup and adults in sort of a driving setup and also put them under an fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging machine, and had the teens approach a red light, same thing with the adults, and as the teens approached a red light, what do you think the teens did? The adults, they stopped. But before this experiment started, Steinberg and Associates told the people that there's going to be a blue light that you see in the upper left corner. And what that means is a technician has come into the lab to check in on you. So in other words, the social part of the brain was going to light up. And let's see how much it lights up. So keep that in the back of your mind. Now, Steinberg put two teenagers. Guess what they did? Approaching the red light. They sped up. They put two adults. Guess what the adults did? They slowed down. So for each participant that were added to the teen car, the teen took a greater risk. Just like oh. we talked about, for each participant mm. added to the adult, the adult did not change. Now we go back to the blue light. The social part of the brain. For the adults, when the technician was there, actually there was no technician in the room. Nothing happened to their brains. They just kept driving. For the teens, the social part of the brain was on fire. Elkind was right. When teens walk into a room between the ages of about 13 to 16, they suddenly feel all lights are on. And you've experienced it with them when they suddenly no longer want to be associated with you, <laughs> right? It's like suddenly they, 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 they like materialize out of nowhere. It's like you're looking at them like you have to have a parent. You didn't just end up on this planet. Now, I'll tell you a story. So I was driving my son up to the Galleria. This back when we lived in Yonkers. And I thought I was cool, right? His friends called me Papa Hoops. I'm hip, right? I'm down with it. And... I don't know, for like three, three or four weeks, drop them off. Uh, his friend's like, hey, how you doing? Uh, I'm Papa Wolves. So I leave, and all of a sudden, like this this one day, we get off at Main Street, this Bronx River Parkway, and Dylan's like, you, and he, you know, lowers his voice. You drop me up here, man. <laughs> <laughs> what? He's good. So we go to the next light, and we get out of the car. <laughs> what are you talking about? My friends don't want to see you. So, you know, I was like, get out of the car. A few expletives were thrown in there, and he got out of the car. So, and like internally, I'm like, oh, my son. Uh, and I called my wife, and I'm like, do you believe this? Kid got out of my car. He, he's like, you know, my friends don't want to see you. And she's like, babe, you know, and we're both counselors. We're both in this field. We totally screwed him up. But, she says, you know, it, it's happening. 
this is the process. And I said, yeah, like what? He's going to turn the corner and his friends think he walked from Yonkers? <laughs> yes. <laughs> there are those moments where they actually have those distortions. Because in addition to the imaginary audience, now if they think everyone's watching them, if they are this star, then they also believe like nobody really understands them. They, 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 they sometimes become like these Shakespearean characters in the tragedy and nobody can possibly understand the depth of me. <laughs> but what I have found is that if you are interested in what they have to say, You'd be fascinated in what they will share with you. But you got to be really, really careful of your facial expressions. <laughs> really careful. Really, really, really careful. So this is an actual experiment that was done at Harvard by Deborah Yergel and Todd. Um, these people make a lot of money, and they come up with some fascinating experiments, right? But anyway, she puts teens and adults into an fMRI machine and decides to show them the six basic human emotions. We all experience fear, anger, sadness, joy, disgust, and shock. And every participant in the research study gets a template. So I'm going to show you what an actor was told um, to express. I'm not going to tell you the emotion. The actor was told, show this expression. What do you see? Okay, raise your hand if you see fear. Okay, raise your hand if you see shock. Yeah, disapproval. disapproval. Okay. Anger? 50% of the teenagers said that's anger. Oh. <laughs> so this act, actor was told, show fear. So let's look at fear again. <laughs> Eyebrows up, teeth there, because when we're afraid, what do we do? <clears throat> we breathe in. <clears throat> Shock is mouth open more. It's more like a <gasps> <laughs> anger. Like, look at it. How is that anger? <laughs> Here's the cognitive distortion. Think about it. If you believe someone's angry with you, mm. are you defensive? Yeah. You ever have those conversations with them and all of a sudden their mood shifts oh, yeah. Yeah. or they go, what? <laughs> what? That's your cue. That's the cue for what? So happy you're telling me this right now. This is great. No, no, no. no. It's your cue to say this, this is what you're seeing is, and it happened to me. I was, I was, um, uh, working with a student the other day, and they were one of one of the, one of the things I love about working with adolescents is they will come out with expressions, and it, it's like I'm so old. <laughs> so this is the first time I heard murder board. Um, how many of you have heard this? Okay, do anyone know what a murder board is? This is no. when a detective is working on a case. Oh, okay. and they yeah, oh, okay. yeah, right. So I had the same expression when I found out. So I'm listening to her, and I've got my eyes down, and I'm like, and she goes, "What?" And I said, "What?" And she's like, "You got your murder board face on." And I said, "I am not angry with you." And she's like, "I didn't say that you were angry. I said you got your murder board face on." Now you need to educate the old wall guy. What are we talking about here? So she said, "It looks like you're trying to put pieces together." And I said, "I am." And I'm sorry for that facial expression. Yeah. So they don't interpret facial expressions the same way that we do. We typically interpret them somewhat accurately. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that Yergel and Todd found was they used completely different parts of the brain that we do. So I want you to do me a favor. Put your two hands up like this. Make fists. Bring them together. Put them down. Take a good look at those two fists. That's a fairly decent model size of a brain. Usually when I do this with like 10th grade boys, they go. Because <laughs> they don't believe me. <laughs> I'm like, yes, this is, this is actually the fact. So, so when, you know, talk.
talking about this, I'm gonna make it as simple as possible. Like just raise your two pinkies. This is part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. This is the part of the brain that's more developed for us. Then if you sort of bang your two, the bottom of your palms together, this is the limbic system. This is a much more primitive part of the brain. This is where um, the primal emotions, our burglar alarm, the amygdala is, our hippocampus, which is memory um, and deep memory. Freud, Freud was right. This is where the subconscious is and then the hypothalamus. So if you just think about walking into someone's house and the food smells like a grandparent's food, how quickly are you transported back to when you were a little kid going over to the grandparent's house? Um, if you smell the, the cologne or the perfume of a former lover, how quickly you're taken back. Uh, and this happens in less than one second because all this is the fastest supercomputer. So in neural impulses travel 700 feet per second. They travel in nanoseconds. We make decisions about people in nanoseconds, split second. And we specially make them with regards to facial expressions. So going back to that facial expression, what Jurgle and Todd found was adults were using the prefrontal cortex. To interpret facial expressions. It's a little bit more advanced. It's like, mm, ah, got it, fear, mm, anger, okay? And because of that, I'm going to respond appropriately. They are responding from their limbic system, much more primitive there. So they come into my office and they will tell me that the math teacher hates them. <laughs> and I will say, what sort of cognitive behavioral evidence do you have for that? <laughs> and they say, absolutely convinced how she looks at me. That's how she looks at me. So I explained this to them. And they're like, no, 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 no. And I said, well, think back. Think about the teachers that you like. What is it about them? I don't know. So what do they do with their hands? What do they like in the classroom? Think about their eyebrows. It has to do with openness. When we look at how we categorize people, Mark Bowden said we basically put people into four categories in less than one second. Every person that we come across, and most people that we come across, we put them in what Bowden called the indifferent category. I moved out of the camera, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> then there's another group that we put into potential sexual partners. Then there's another group that we see as enemies. And then there's another group that we see as friends. And what makes a person a friend has to do with openness. Think about how many of you have dogs? What do they do when they feel really, really safe with you? They fall over. Yeah. They wag their tails. You look at the research on teacher, teachers who fist bump students on their way into the classroom. Just a fist bump. Their outcomes are typically above other teachers who stand behind, like I'm doing tonight, <laughs> behind a podium. There's no sort of connection there. What we want them to sort of do during this period is spend a little bit more time in their prefrontal cortex, this part of the brain that is developing. So the way in which this develops um, is... Sort, sort of like a wire. Okay, let's do this. Um, put your hand up like that. That's a nerve cell. Here's the soma, and here are the dendrites, and here's the axon. Information travels from one cell to the next one. Just like this, this is made up of two components. So on the outside is plastic, and on the inside is what metal material? That's of the C. Copper. So every for every sort of year, I'm being really simplistic. Um, the axon will develop a layer of myelin sheath, which actually not only protects the neural impulse, but it sends it down faster and faster and faster. You want to see how old a brain is, you cut an axon. I don't recommend that you do this. <laughs> but if you do the same thing with a tree, you count the rings, you'll see how old that tree is. 
The unfortunate thing is that as we age and these neural connections in our prefrontal cortex get stronger, we also lose other ones. So for us, our prefrontal cortex is stronger, so we can plan better. They're learning how to do this. They're learning how to manage their time. They're learning how to become organized. It's not that they can't do it. It's that they need a little bit of help with it. And what I have found over the years is that sometimes high schools will say, well, they should have learned that in middle school. And middle school says, well, they should have learned that in elementary school. And elementary school teachers say, you should have done it. <laughs> everybody is blaming everybody. And you know which institution is actually doing it? The colleges. They have centers set up for students where they can learn study skills. That's a bit late. But the most successful students I've ever worked with are not the ones with the highest IQs. It's the ones who have mastered executive functioning or at least know who to go to to help with their executive functioning. And it's really, really hard for us to watch them fumble these things and make the mistakes. But none of them learned how to tie their shoes on their own. They needed help with it until they got to the place. And none of you could predict when they were going to do it. Same thing with riding a bike. No one could predict when they were going to be able to do it. But it just happened. And that's what happens in the brain. I'm not making it up. You will see dendritic spines reaching for neural connections, just like muscles doing it. And then all of a sudden, boom, it gets there. It's like when you're learning a new language and suddenly you can say a full sentence in it or you can understand something, it clicks. If you're in therapy and you finally get that, you, you're actually strengthening a neural connection. For them, the 14-year-olds, what they have is they have all of these potential neural connections. Um, so let me put it out to you this way. Does anyone know which president uh, was responsible for setting up the interstate system? Eisenhower. Yeah, he went to Germany. He was like, wow, look at these roads. And they can get from here to there without a problem. Because when he was young in the Army Corps of Engineers, and he went from D.C. all the way to California, it took him 50, 60. There was one main road called the Lincoln Highway, and it wasn't even paved. But they had a lot of side roads. And those are your younger ones. They don't have 87. You want to stay off of 287. They don't have 95, but they've got 22. They've got the Bronx River Parkway. They have got Old Army Road. They've got Central Avenue. That's why you might have to ask them five times to take out garbage. Because the first time that you ask them, <laughs> they check their phone. <laughs> and the second time that you ask them, they put down their phone. And then the third time that you ask them, they pick up their phone. And then the fourth time you ask them, they look out and they see a snowflake. <laughs> and then they wonder if school's going to be closed. And then yeah. finally you yell, and their response is, I'm doing it. And they are in their minds. <laughs> they are doing it because they don't have the neural connections made just yet. So, go ahead. So I just want to make an observation about so these largely are executive functions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, back on your comment that you know, high school you should learn it, in middle school you should learn it there, there, there. Yeah. Can't speak for when the kids are four or whatever, but I will say, kids who are adolescents, mm -hmm. you can tell them like try this. Try the Pomodoro method. Try setting up a chart. Try, you can give them all kinds of great executive functioning tips. Yep. They do not want to hear it from their parents. I, one of my children yep. attended a school mm -hmm. where they literally had class, not just like a, once a year someone yep. came in for an hour, but they had a class where the kids went every day yep. where they learned these skills and they could take it because. It wasn't somewhere they were yep. emotionally connected. And I will say it works well. It does. And th those are the unfortunate experiences that many of us have. And it doesn't matter if it's executive skill. It can be anything. Your kid comes home 
and says, guess what Mr. Jones told me today? And you're like, wow, I've been saying that for five freaking years. And this schmuck comes along and suddenly they're like, I mean, how did that happen? Um, so you got to remember, so I invite you to remember that the relationship that we have with them, especially at that time, it's appropriate for them to individuate. So they are probably going to challenge you, and there's nothing wrong with trying to advocate with the school for someone to try and help them with executive skills. And some high schools, some middle schools are able to implement those types of courses, but one of the challenges, especially in a high-performing district, is the demands for APs. So what, what do people really want? Do they want the access to AP classes? Or they, do they want to, to give them these essential skills? And when we, when we look at the workforce, some of the most valuable classes uh, are things in like um, how to balance a checkbook, how to communicate in a relationship, why eye rolling is the greatest predictor of divorce. Yes, eye rolling is the greatest predictor of divorce. Um, why are people still getting married if 47% of marriages within the first seven years end up in divorce? Maybe we have misconstrued the concept of what marriage is, that we're going to live happily ever after. <laughs> That's not happening. It's work. Marriage is work. It's two people joining. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, we, we talked a little bit about brain, and, and I think this other thing that we need to talk about are those real-life situations when you're in a conflict with that 14-year-old, with that 18-year-old. And what I know for myself is there, there were times when Dylan was younger where I would give him a timeout. And then there was this magical point at which I entered, like, you no longer need a timeout. And what I've learned and what the research shows us is it's quite the reverse. Uh, we actually require a timeout. Um, John Gottman, in his research with looking at couples, what he has found is that in any conflict, typically people go into what's called a flooding period, and their systems become flooded with cortisol. Uh, when we feel like we're being attacked, <clears throat> when our kids feel like they're not getting their way, when our kids are convinced that we are the worst parent on the planet because we won't let them go to the after prom party because every other parent is doing it. And that those cortisol levels, that is the time where you need a break. And when you take the break, give a specific time at which you'll come back. Say, I need a break. Let's come back to this, say, in two hours. I don't want to do that. I want to finish it now. Because what part of the brain are they in? In their limbic system. And what part of the brain do they want you in? Your limbic system. Think about all those arguments that you've had. That when you walk away and 20 minutes later you go, I don't believe I said that. We have removed ourselves from the prefrontal cortex. And I'm going to put out something a little bit more metaphysical here. I think sometimes when we're in those conflicts with our kids, we're also coming from a very historical place. Many of us are coming from this place of, if I ever talked this way to my parents, I would have been hit. I would, you fill it in. This would have happened. And because of that, that elicits a very strong response from us. And we might get to a place of, like, what else do I do? And we just lose it on them. And that doesn't help anybody. So having that space, that time apart, and then coming back to it, when you both agree that maybe an hour, or maybe you need to go for a walk. And if you do come back, I'm just going to throw this out there. Go for a ride with them. People call it windshield time because you're not making direct eye contact with them. You got something else to focus on. They got nowhere to go. <laughs> and you can talk about it without making eye contact. And maybe by the time that you get out of the car, you haven't resolved it, but maybe you can understand where they're coming from, and maybe they can understand where you're coming from. And it will work a little bit better next time. Um, the things that really help with, with resiliency uh, are achieving those little goals. So 
So if they're getting 85s and then they want the 95, lower it, maybe an 88. All of us walk into the new year and like, this is the year that I'm going to do it. And by January 17th, we're crying in a bag of Oreos, right? Because we set our goals too high. What if we just say for this week, I'm not going to have pasta. And then we get to the end of the week and we, boom, we achieve it. That's one of the most powerful dopamine boosts. So what we've talked about tonight really are ways in which we can get them. Many of us have coming to the table afraid that we're losing them. We're not losing them, but the relationship is changing. Many of us are afraid that we're going to lose them to car accidents. We're going to lose them to boyfriends and girlfriends. We're going to lose them to social media. We're going to lose them to drugs and alcohol. We're going to lose them to gangs. We're going to... The relationship is changing. And with that change, our parenting strategies need to change. And if you have a bunch of kids, and I heard a few of you talking about it, each of them are different. They, they all have their own unique personalities. And what works with the oldest one is not going to work. The middle one is probably not going to work. But the youngest one, I am the youngest, and we are the best. And that's it. Yeah. You want to hear it. Um, so an expression that, I, that I've come up with is that teens, when you get them, you've got them. And there's a couple of things that we talked about tonight on ways to get them. And I really hope that you walk out of here with, with a sort of a more of an understanding to not take their behavior so personal. We've already established that they're pretty narcissistic, so it's about them. And it's not about us and our failure as a parent. We're doing the best that we can. You can go onto YouTube and watch any video now on how to fix plumbing in your house. I'm amazed at it. I don't need to hire electricians. I can do it myself, but I still haven't found a video that showed me exactly how to parent Dylan. It's a personal experience, and you're going to mess up, and that's important. And you're going to argue with your partner in front of your kids, and that's important too, provided that they see you make up, provided that they see you resolve the conflict, because we're teaching them for the future. We're teaching them how to resolve conflict. And on the grand scheme, I'm not just talking about conflict at home. I'm talking about conflict on the grand scale. Quote. So um, for all of its um, negativity with social media, I'm on social media. Please feel free to follow me. Uh, and if you want to reach out to me, uh, because I'm so damn hip, I created a QR code. Oh, wait, let me go back. So, that, so it's pretty simple. Tula Hand Speaks. We're also on YouTube. And Pascal, would yes. it be worth um, sharing the PowerPoint with you? Yes, yes please. Actually, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. So what I, what I will do is... Um, We're all on the same email. Then I'll post it with you. Okay. Yeah, so what I'll do is I will share this along with a... Um, uh, two-page uh, resource document of some books and some websites. Uh, so this will take you to the website. My wife and I are on it. Um, <clears throat> we work with, um, this is the thing that I really love to do is to go around and do presentations. Uh, but we also do some coaching and some college counseling and some other things. So any final questions? Yeah. So there's a few people on Zoom actually, more like 15 people. Um, oh, okay. I just want to ask them if they have any questions. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions on Zoom? Put it in the chat. While we're waiting, any questions from me? A lot, right? I mean, no, 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 but man. this has really yeah. opened up a lot of thoughts in my head because I have walked away from my kids in tears. Yes. Because it was like, I can't believe I she just said this to me, or I can't believe, like, the disrespect, or, yes. you know, or I walked away from them saying, like, what is your thought process? Can mm -hmm. you just explain to me yeah. how, you know, you have this, and, you know, all of a sudden you're here. What, what did you think in between? Like, and, and it drives me nuts. Yeah. Um, but I also know I, I, I get to my yelling point yep. very fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now I'm thinking I need to fix my face. Yep. <laughs> and that's, like, yeah. going on in my head. that's wonderful because it gives us or lower um, your voice, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so when I work with um, um, 
so uh, I teach in the um, uh, graduate council program at Fairfield. And one of the activities I like to do with councils in training is have them uh, videotape themselves, and then we watch it. And it is painful um, <laughs> because we actually see what we do. We have a very hard time really getting feedback on what it is. So in those moments when, and you probably do have them when you're close with your kids, is to say to them, you know, what is it that mom does that, that really gets you going? Because this is something that I, I want to maintain a really, really strong relationship with you, and we're not going to agree on all these things, but um, what really gets you? And if they share it with you, then you get to share it with them. So start with your vulnerability and then say, well, you know, thank you so much for sharing because mommy feels. So remember, we're, we're the ones with the developed prefrontal cortex, but we have to model vulnerability for them as well. So, and here's another really quick one. Abigail Baird uh, from Vassar College did this really fascinating study. Teens and adults, again, an fMRI, um, Basic situations, things like biting a light bulb, swimming with sharks, eating a salad, uh, didn't make them do it, but brought it up in a prompter and asked each participant, is this a good idea or a bad idea? Um, so everything that was a risk, the team said it was bad. But it took them three seconds longer. Baird said, why? You'd be fascinated to hear this. The part of the brain that the adults were using was the limbic system. In other words, the adults weren't thinking. The teens were using their prefrontal cortex. Huh, biting a light bulb. Huh. That's a bad idea. They don't have the experience. So they actually have to think it through and then go there. So. This is what makes driving scary, because three seconds, hmm. um, but in the safety of our homes and that expanded adolescence, we can, we can watch them make mistakes. And there are some soft mistakes. You know, getting a zero on a test is a soft mistake. Uh, it's helpful at times when those things come back to them to help have them look at their entire GPA, because that's what colleges look at. They don't look at that one test. They don't look at those homework assignments. They look at it and ask them, mathematically, how much is this going to impact your overall GPA? And they may be in their limbic system, and guess what? If they are, take 20 minutes and come back. Because then they'll be able to say, not much. Because they know that you're right. And that's okay. That's a powerful learning experience. Any questions from Zoom? No. Okay. Yeah. They also might not know how to do it. But. Oh, okay. We'll have our own cool kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, please visit us on our website. Folks, thanks. You've been awesome. I Thank really you. enjoyed this. Thank you so much for contacting me and inviting me.